By looking at the chemistry of the ice, we can learn about past temperature, and by looking at the air, we can actually measure the carbon dioxide content. And one of the things that we learn is that past temperature and carbon dioxide vary together. They go up together, they go down together. And over the last 800,000 years or so, atmospheric carbon dioxide was never higher than about 280 parts per million until we started adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And now it's about 390 parts per million. And that's about 40% higher than it was when carbon dioxide was only varying for natural reasons. But now we're headed for 500 parts per million or more. That pace is 100 to 1,000 times greater than the pace at which things have changed by themselves naturally. The amazing thing to me is that we're already seeing impacts because the change already has been so small, right? It's been 0.8 degrees C, about 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit, since 1850 or so. And yet we've seen so much stuff, crazy stuff going on already. just observers, these two little dots on the side of the mountain. And we watched and recorded the largest witness Cavian event ever caught on tape. The Cavian face is 300, sometimes 400 feet tall. Pieces of ice were shooting up out of the ocean 600 feet and then falling. city just breaking apart in front of your eyes. So how big was this calving event that we just looked at? We'll resort to some illustrations again to give you a sense of scale. It took a hundred years for it to retreat eight miles from 1900 to 2000. From 2000 to 2010, it retreated nine miles. So in 10 years, it retreated more than it had in the previous 100. miraculous, horrible, scary thing. I don't know that anybody's really seen the miracle and horror of that. 
It's as if the entire lower tip of Manhattan broke off, except that the thickness, the height of it, is equivalent to buildings that are two and a half or three times higher than they are. One of the really troubling things about climate change is that almost all of the world's uh, prestigious climatologists are much more frightened about all this than the public is. And the great irony and tragedy of our time is that a lot of the general public thinks that science is still arguing about that. Science is not arguing about that. The changes are happening, very visible, they're photographable, they're measurable. There is no significant scientific dispute about that. What for me is so powerful and actually unprecedented in the work that he is doing is visualizing the change that allows us to actually see what was and what is becoming. This is all wrong. I shouldn't be up here. I should be back in school on the other side of the ocean. Yet you all come to us young people for hope. How dare you? You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words, and yet I'm one of the lucky ones. People are suffering, people are dying, entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction, and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? For more than 30 years, the science has been crystal clear. How dare you continue to look away and come here saying that you are doing enough when the politics and solutions needed are still nowhere in sight. You say you hear us and that you understand the urgency. But no matter how sad and angry I am, I do not want to believe that. Because if you really understood the situation and still kept on failing to act, then you would be evil, and that I refuse to believe. The popular idea of cutting our emissions in half in 10 years only gives us a 50% chance of staying below 1.5 degrees and the risk of setting off irreversible chain reactions beyond human control. 50% may be acceptable to you, but those numbers do not include tipping points, most feedback loops, additional warming hidden by toxic air pollution or the aspects of equity and climate justice. They also rely on my generation sucking hundreds of billions of tons of your CO2 out of the air with technologies that barely exist. So a 50% risk is simply not acceptable to us, we who have to live with the consequences. To have a 67% chance of staying below a 1.5 degrees of global temperature rise, the best odds given by the IPCC, the world had 420 gigatons of CO2 left to emit back on January 1st, 2018. Today, that figure is already down to less than 350 gigatons. How dare you pretend that this can be sold with just business as usual and some technical solutions? With today's emissions levels, that remaining CO2 budget will be entirely gone within less than eight and a half years. There will not be any solutions or plans presented in line with these figures here today, because these numbers are too uncomfortable and you are still not mature enough to tell it like it is. You are failing us, but the young people are starting to understand your betrayal. The eyes of all future generations are upon you. And if you choose to fail us, I say we will never forgive you. We will not let you get away with this. Right here, right now, is where we draw the line. The world is waking up, and change is coming, whether you like it or not. Thank you.
You can see what's called the trim line. It's the high water mark of the glacier in 1984. That vertical change is the height of the Empire State Building. Looking down on it, now we turn on our time lapse. You can see the terminus retreating, you can see this river being formed, you can see it deflating. You go back a couple of years in time, that's where it started. That's where it ended a few months ago. You know, we're really in the midst of geologic scale change. You know, our brains are programmed to think that geology is something that happened a long time ago or will happen a long time in the future. And we don't think that that can happen during these little years that we each live on this planet. But the reality is that it does, that things can happen very, very, very quickly. We're living through one of those moments of epochal geologic change right now. I'm on the phone with Jim on one of our regular check-ins. Like Jim, it just, nothing's happening. Oh wait, Jim, 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 this is the, the big pizza starting to cast. Let me call you back. All that. Okay, bye. Still going? Yeah, in that V section right there. Holy shit, look at that big bird rolling. All four are running, right? Yeah. Look at that. current moment, not just political, is the most grim moment in human history. We are now in a situation where this generation, in fact, in the next few years, is going to have to make a decision of cosmic significance, which has never arisen before. Will organized human society survive? And there are two enormous threats. It's the threat of environmental catastrophe, which at least is getting some attention, not enough. Uh, the other is uh, the threat of nuclear war, which is increasing sharply by the Trump administration, in fact. These have to be dealt with quickly. Otherwise, there's nothing to talk about. And notice that the wrecking ball in the White House just doesn't give a damn. He's having fun. He's serving his rich constituency. So what the hell, let's destroy the world. And it's not that they don't know it. Some months ago, maybe a year ago by now, the one of the Trump bureaucracies, the National Transportation Administration, came out with what I think is the most astonishing document in the entire history of the human species. Got almost no attention. It was a, a long 500-page uh, environmental assessment in which they tried to determine what the environment would be like at, at the end of the century. And they concluded uh, by the end of the century, uh, temperatures will have risen seven degrees Fahrenheit, yeah. approximately. That's about twice the level that scientists regard as uh, feasible for organized human life. Uh, the World Bank describes it as cataclysmic. So what's their conclusion? Conclusion is we should have no more constraints on automotive emissions. And the reasoning is very solid. We're going off the cliff anyway, so why not have fun? <laughs> Has anything like that ever appeared in human history? No, there's nothing like it. And this is where people usually, people usually start talking about hope. Solar panels, wind power, circular economy, and so on. But I'm not going to do that. We've had 30 years of pep talking and selling positive ideas. And I'm sorry, but it doesn't work. Because if it would have the emissions would have gone down by now. They haven't. And yes, we do need hope. Of course we do. But the one thing we need more than hope is action. Once we start to act, hope is everywhere. So instead of looking for hope, 
look for action. Then, and only then, hope will come. Today, we use 100 million barrels of oil every single day. There are no politics to change that. There are no rules to keep that oil in the ground. So we can't save the world by playing by the rules. Because the rules have to be changed. Everything needs to change. And it has to start today. Thank you.